Hello, and welcome to Rocking Chair University. My name is Hal Taylor, and I've been making rocking chairs for almost 30 years. This is where it all started for me, Sam Maloof. What did Sam do that was so special? This chair that you see here is, in my opinion, the most beautiful rocking chair I've ever seen. How did Sam do that? It is not the strongest rocking chair, and it's not without its imperfections, but Sam had a way of taking what was in front of him and with patient application of rasps and sandpaper would create a harmonious shape with each piece until the entire chair was one cohesive bundle of sheer beauty. Sam's artistic sensibility was off the map. One characteristic Sam had that nobody talks about was that he had a photographic memory for three-dimensional shapes. This is my opinion and I'm sticking with it. I've watched Sam working on one of his small occasional chairs shape the right ear to completion with a small die grinder, then turn, essentially turning his back to the one he just shaped, shape the other one to completion without ever looking back at the first, and they were perfect mirror images. Perhaps Sam made use of this ability when he made furniture, being able to see clearly what he wanted, then bring it into fruition. Sam did more than create pleasant shapes. Sam created notes, then chords, then symphonies. The shapes and lines in his rocking chair worked together as melodies blending in the songs of the great jazz musicians. I began writing this book around 1997 when a fellow from Texas by the name of Rob called and asked if I could help him make a rocking chair. I said sure. It all began by mailing handwritten notes to get him through the processes. He did end up with a beautiful rocking chair that was the envy of his neighborhood. You can see some of the original handwritten notes here. My inspiration for making rocking chairs was of course Sam Maloof. When I first saw his chairs in fine woodworking, I was blown away. Then I saw my first Maloof rocking chair in person when visiting the Renwick Gallery in Washington, D.C. I probably spent a good 45 minutes walking circles around this beautiful maple chair, admiring most of all the incredible symmetry of the lines. Well, time went by and when my first daughter was three years old, I decided to make her a rocking chair. The year was 1992, and there were no plans back then, so I had to figure it out. I searched in fine woodworking and found an article by Sam about how he made a chair. It was from the winter of 1975. The information was skimpy, but he did provide the dimensions of his seat, and there was a small photo showing Sam's chair in profile. Armed with those two pieces of information, I created this chair for my daughter, Rachel. This is not Rachel, by the way. This is Rachel's son, Emerson. And the chair is almost 30 years old. You can see the joints are not as elegant as Sam's, but this was the first chair of any kind that I had made. Since it was a child's chair, I made the little spindles in the headrest such that they would spin. Several years later, I began making chairs as a career. And of course, I again looked to Sam. I am asked frequently, why don't you give Sam credit for your design? Well, number one, I have been quite generous in giving credit to Sam, and I'm the only chairmaker I know of who actually gave Sam one of my rocking chairs out of appreciation for his contribution. He later gave this chair to his son, I am told. And number two, this is no longer Sam's design. It is my own and I would like to know why folks never asked Sam to give credit to Hans Wegner and Finn Jewell, the two legendary Scandinavian furniture designers where Sam got many of his ideas. I have been making this rocking chair for over a quarter of a century. What impressed me when I first saw a photo of a Maloof rocking chair was the graceful, generous curves throughout. Many people don't notice, but virtually all of the photos Sam authorizes to be published were either from the side or slightly off the side. He did not like photos directly from the front or the back. I discovered what I believed to be the reason for this when I started making a rocker using his construction methods. 
All of the joints from the side show a graceful and generous radius. However, looking at his chairs directly from the front or back, those generous radii are nowhere to be found. The inside radiuses at the seat leg joints are tiny. They must be completed within a quarter inch of space. Part of the reason for this is Sam's joints used a quarter inch rabbiting bit only, and he used a single eight quarter board to make both his front and back legs. He was in effect bound by his material and did not see the need to expand beyond that limit since he was, of course, making the most beautiful rocking chair in the world at that time. Sam's rear leg joint, the legendary Maloof joint, for which a special router bit set must be purchased, was fairly complex and not very strong, which is why he always used two screws in every seat leg joint. In order to execute a Maloof back leg joint required a notch cut in the seat with one side cut at 95 degrees on the long grain and 90 degrees on the cross grain side. Then two special five or six degree bits were used to rabbit the side of the notch cut at 95 degrees, one for the top, one for the bottom, and a third straight quarter inch bit was used for the other side of the notch. Then the leg had to be cut to match. Not a terribly simple task. When I started making rockers, I might have purchased that special Maloof router bit, but I did not have the money. How can I accomplish canting my back legs out at five or six degrees without the router bits, I thought. It was obvious to me <coughs> that if I added some wood at the back leg joint, I could cut that added piece at any angle I desired, and then I would be dealing with a very simple 90 degree joint. Hallelujah! This is what I did. Adding this piece of wood and increasing the rabbit to a half inch by a half inch provided much more glue surface and also provided the opportunity to greatly increase the radius of the transition. So now the view from the front was as beautiful as the view from the side. It followed that if I added wood to the front leg, I could achieve the same beautiful radius there as well. And this is what I did. What other innovations did I include in my chair? A lot. Here are only a few. Vertical headrest. Since my time in the Army, I drove British sports cars. I loved the way the seats supported my back. That is the way a chair should set, I thought. A flat chair back was not a good thing in my view. Then, after about four chairs, I had a dream in which I was making a chair. And when it came to make the headrest, I turned the grain vertical instead of the customary horizontal. I have used this method ever since this dream. The huge benefit of this is that, can, that I can achieve a very significant curvature of the back by coopering the headrest. Many rocking chair makers today use this method. Flexible back braces. Very early on, I discovered the value of having flexible back braces. The problem with back braces being flexible is you have to design a system that keeps them from being stressed when they flex. I did that. I was never secretive about any of my innovations and shared with other makers when they asked. One rocking chair maker in California has claimed this invention as his own after I explained the system to him at an ACC crafts fair in Baltimore back in the mid 90s. Exquisite lumbar support. This development went along with the flexible back braces. I get reports frequently from customers who relate that when a particular friend of theirs visits who has a bad back, they will claim the rocker for the duration of their visit. Making chairs to fit their new owners. When I started making rockers, no rocking chair makers offered to make rocking chair to fit. If makers were asked to do so, they would claim that rocking chairs are too complicated and if you changed one thing, it would throw everything off. The relationship between the rocker size and the proper rocker radius, the part that touches the floor, was not understood. Thus, they ran into problems when they changed one without altering the other. Those rocking chair makers who had found a rocker radius that worked well for them stuck with it and did not want to change. Eventually, I went on to discover a simple formula for determining the proper rocker radius for any type of rocking device, be it a rocking cradle, a rocking horse, a rocking chair, anything. I shared this information freely and many rocking chair makers have benefited from this information. Early on, being influenced by James Krenoff, I began incorporating bilateral symmetry into my chairs. When cutting out my parts, 
I cut them in such a manner that the grains in the arms would match. The headrest would exhibit a beautiful bilateral symmetry, as would the seat, and even the rockers would look like mirror images of one another. This takes only a little time, but adds to the beauty of my chairs, I believe, because it accentuates the beauty of what Mother Nature has created. I'm glad you stopped by for a visit. You can always find me in my little hobbit house on the side of a mountain in Stanley, Virginia. If you have seven days to spare and would like an exquisite rocking chair, come on out to the mountains and make a chair with me. I don't make you suffer the indignity of a cold hotel room. I stick you in my spare bedroom where you have your own bath with a shower. I'll leave the light on for you.